Good morning. And welcome to the Alliance Church on this beautiful day out there. Everybody else is shoveling snow, and we're shoveling sunshine. Would you stand with us, please, singing, Just a Little Talk with Jesus Makes It Right. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn and then you know a little fire is burned. And you'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my path seems dreary without a ray of cheer. And then a cloud above me hides a light of day. The mists of sin may rise and hit the starry skies. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Yes, it does. Oh, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. And when you feel a little prayer will turn, then you'll know a little fire is burned. You find just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes will fill with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. So let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faintest cry He will answer by and by When you feel a little prayer will turn And then you'll know a little fire is burning You'll find just a little talk with Jesus Makes it right All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the lord name above all names shall stand exalted more and more but god the father's own right hand where angels host the door blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be the name blessed be the name Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all his kingdoms conquer, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told Him your heart's hidden secret? How long since you prayed, how long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Call him your friend. How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? How long has it 
been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven. How long since you knew that he'd answer you and would keep you the long night through. How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that the day's worth the living? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the rain last night. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son to save us from our sins. Be with each one here today that's come to worship. Be with the ones that are traveling, Lord, and the ones that aren't well. We have a long prayer chain, Lord, and but you know, you know who needs it. You know what your will is also. Be with Jeremiah as he gives a message today, and be with each one here. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, before we sit down, um, we're going to lift up holy hands and just Yay, welcome each welcome, other. Just, welcome. Yeah, turn welcome. around, say, welcome, you know, welcome. welcome someone. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to speak up here. Sound better? What? Does it sound better? Yeah. You're down there in the morning service. I know. All right. Yeah. Then you can take a seat. I know. I don't give instructions. I just figure. Herd mentality. That's what it is. Um, so, welcome. I know the mic sounds like I'm a pilot on an airplane. Um, no, you just said the water. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's what, you know, you hear the people. Oh, this is your captain speaking. We will be, you know, you get to hear that all, all today. So that's great. Um, well, welcome to the church. Welcome to the Lions Church. I'm glad I see faces back, and I'm I'm glad to see you guys here because we haven't seen some of you in like years. It feels like 30 years, right? It couldn't feel like for 30 years. I'm not that old. No. Uh, oh yeah, right. Uh, actually, my wife is turning an age, and she doesn't like it. Uh, pretty soon Careful. here, and so, Careful. no, I didn't say what age, she's turning an age, speaking of ages, um, birthdays, um, we like to celebrate each other because we are the family of God, did anyone have a birthday from last Monday to today, stand, yeah. up. Oh, stand here on we go. up so we can, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Well, we're going to run out of bags. Man, so many people born in January. That's great. Well, God bless you all. Thank you for allowing us to sing and stand. And we're not going to make fun of you behind your backs or anything. So, you know, we don't ask for ages either. But I pray that God gives you a great year and that he can bring you closer to him this year. So thank you. Um, and anyone else, you know, if, if you know someone that has a birthday... And you want to call them out, you got to poke them, yeah, get them up, okay? Um, how about anniversaries? Anyone celebrating an anniversary from last Monday to today that we can celebrate? No? No? All right. Um, and then the last thing, how about, oh, Jim wasn't here last week, so I had to do this. Um, how about you're, you're here for the first time or you're back finally? Um, uh, we just, we like you to sound up just so we know. Because we're, you know, if you go out there into our foyer, we love everyone that comes, and so we want your picture on that. Oh so first gosh. time here, first time back. Okay, yeah, welcome, welcome, welcome. So we just, we just, wait, 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 I didn't get to explain my whole thing, my whole shtick, people. All right, so we just want to know your first name and where you're from, okay? Social security number, date of birth, and all that as well. Okay. That comes later. All right, just first name and where you, where you came from. All right, Colorado. Deborah, Oregon. Okay, and then you can sit down. <laughs> Larry, Larry, Minnesota. All right, oh welcome, y'all. Doug, Minnesota. Okay. Bill, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Alaska and Iowa. All right, and then right here. 
I think he's, yeah. He's and Laura from British Columbia. All right. Woo! Welcome. We had to smuggle them in. <laughs> Roy from Nevada. All right, welcome, welcome. Roy. Carl and Connie from Ohio. All right, welcome. Welcome. Right up here. Ontario. All right, so you snuck in too, right? Is it that Ontario or is it that Ontario? That, that way, okay. Yeah, because we would have to sneak you in either way, California or Canada. Yeah. No. Oh. All right. Welcome. All right. All right. Welcome. welcome. All right. Yeah. How about here? Okay, so we need all the Canadians to sit right here. This is this is where they've decided to mingle right there. How about here? Dennis, Peggy, Kathy, Oregon. All right, welcome. welcome, welcome. All right, so welcome you all. It's it's good that you know. One of the things we say is not many people are born in Quartzsite, so we just like to know where everyone's from. So, um, and in fact, so Jim's going to come on up. He's got some um, some announcements for y'all. And if you want, to, one of the things we do is if you go into the foyer, there's a, a map of North America. And if um, you want to be a, a part of that, I just moved that out for you. <laughs> Ungrateful. Uh, <laughs> just a compromise. <laughs> um, but right. <laughs> I'm trying to explain this. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to um, just, we like to just see where everyone's from. So we like to take pictures of people. Um, and we put them up on the on the map, and then we draw. We don't draw, but we use yarn. And we just show where people are from, just because it gives a sense of, hey, none of us meant to be here, but God brought us all here for whatever reason. And so it's just a an appointment. exactly. So there you go. Hi, my name is Jim. <laughs> This sounds like one of those meetings. What am I doing here? We have so many new people here today. Um, I want to bring this, these to your attention. If you want to get, in, get a hold of the uh, pastor and communicate with him or anything, fill it out, put it in the offering. Um, and also, this one here, if you have one already at home, uh, this one's not yours. Give it to your friend, your neighbor, whatever. It tells on the back all the things that's coming up. Clear until April. So pass it out that way. It's a good way to break the break the uh, ice or whatever. There's Witness. No Pardon? There's no ice here. <laughs> I have seen ice here. I think it was a Tuesday. Okay, annual meeting. This is important. Uh, annual meeting for members, uh, Tuesday, January 25th, 6 p.m., meeting right here. we got business for the church to take care of. In the fellowship hall, right here in the fellowship hall. Okay. Uh, that's about the size of that. Um, Tuesday, tops meets in the fellowship hall at 7 a.m., uh, ladies Bible study 1 p.m. in the fellowship hall uh, that's by uh, D. Adkins B. Adkins she's uh, teaching that and uh, again the church meeting on Tuesday 6 p.m. Wednesday's apolog apologetic class 6 p.m. meeting that fellowship hall over there uh, ladies prayer meeting at 6 p.m. contract Marika if you want to get involved with that uh, ladies prayer meeting Thursday ladies quilting uh, 9 a.m. still going strong Friday rec night teen rec night again all you newcomers you don't uh, want to get involved come out and help the uh, teen teenagers have a good time partying never mind we've never had anybody take us up on that yet <laughs> but I always want to offer I want to make the offer As soon as I get back from Detroit. <laughs> okay, fellowship breakfast on Saturday at 7.30 a.m. at the eatery. Okay, tonight, Wade Hammond in concert. How many of you have seen him? 
He is really good. He's good, uh, got a great voice, beautiful voice, uh, gospel country, a little country to him. So uh, come on out and visit with him tonight, 6 p.m. here. That's about the size of that. Any um, in, in next Sunday, on the uh, 30th, it's in your bulletin, uh, the Liberty Quartet. You want to be sure and make that, okay? Pardon? Yeah, they're good too. Mm. Is that you, Lord? Oh, it's you. I thought I heard a voice. You have that. I have one too. You can do that. Thing. Just... <laughs> I'm afraid to. You need to pray for Mary, the mother of twins. Oh. Mary just had twins, has COVID on ventilator. She is um, Brittany. Well. Oh, Brittany, I put on the Mary. I'm sorry, um, but so Brittany um, is on the ventilator, but she's doing better. No. Oh no, I thought it went down. They were going to move her so that they could try the the eco, the eco. yeah. There was a oh, that's right. Okay, so so she has a a blemish in her brain scan, and so. Right. So she's very unstable. Yeah, so, okay, so we really need to pray for her, Brittany. Um, she just had twins. I mean, she was in the hospital. Yeah, they're, yeah so we really need to pre- praying for Brittany. Um, the dad gets to see the babies on the 23rd, hopefully. Oh, he takes them. Okay, good. So this is something, you know, started praying last week. She did a little bit better, but now the brain scan um, has put things in jeopardy. So we need to be praying. Uh, pray for her, babies, dad, doctors, you know, second nephew, whoever. Um, bring them before the Lord, okay? So. Wow. We have another request here uh, by Lucy. Uh, cousin Michael in New York, COVID. Uh, pray for him also. It, I, um, on the yeah, on the back of your bulletin, that's the prayer list. People are hurting. Yeah, that's not all of it. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we have had some good things. We've, we've seen miracles come out of the, our prayers for people here. People have been healed by the Lord by prayer when we bring it up. I'm not sure if I got all this correct or not, but uh, um, with the children, the twins and all that, let's just let's pray. Father in heaven, just thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for your mercies. We, Father, we just ask your mercy, your grace upon uh, Mary in this situation with the twins and all of that, that. That I'm not sure that I have it clear in my mind, but Lord, you have it clear completely in your mind you have them in the palm of your hands and father we ask that you would bless them bless them with a healing and lord just restore them to good health father we turn them entirely over to you and we ask you to heal as you would see fit and uh, father we just pray for michael also Uh, we just pray that you would heal him as well and all those others suffering from the um, things going around. Father, we just pray now that uh, you would bless the rest of this service. We ask you in the name of Jesus to open our hearts, teach us new and wonderful things as pastor preaches, and we ask that you would open his heart and teach us those wonderful things. Father, we thank you for your mercies, for your grace, for your love, and uh, just give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, so you know how you get into a situation and that situation becomes everything to you? Like you can't think of anything else but that situation. You know, so you might be in a job and you might um, be working and working and working and it's just everything takes a back seat. Family, your own personal time, everything, right? It's just 
So during the winter time, I start, in my mind, I have a ministry calendar, and that ministry calendar starts in October, okay? Because that's when the winter comes, right? And it's separated into two parts. There's the winter and the summer. And the reason why it's separated into two parts is because in, in Quartzsite, we have two seasons, hot and cold. <laughs> and so it's just, that's how I, I think about it. I have my winter calendar and I have my summer calendar. And during the winter time, every, it feels like it's just one thing after another, right? If you look on that blue thing, um, that blue little calendar, you'll see that sometimes it's just, it, it's bam, 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 right? We have our Thanksgiving celebration, and then the, that very week we have Thanksgiving, and then following that you have the bonfire, and then a couple of weeks later you have the children's program, and then, you know, and it just it's just feels like this. And then this w- January, we have, we have the ventriloquist last week, which if you weren't here, you missed out. It was... It was hilarious. He was a phenomenal pianist. Um, it was just a great time. And he brought you up with comedy, and then he, like, hit you in the feels. I mean, it was like, at the end, it was like, man, that was really, like, powerful stuff. Um, but you can still catch it because it's on Facebook. Um, but it just feels like a constant thing. In fact, when um, I was the youth pastor and lead pastor, I had all this stuff to do and my kids were like oh dad's not here you know because he has this to do and this to do and this to do and so when we hired a youth pastor a while back they were like finally dad has time you know and so then i had to take it over a few months ago both and they were all like man dad's not gonna have any time so we've had to really work on this is time right and make time and so it's just, you get into that, that focus, and this can happen in anything, right? I've watched teenagers for the past 17 years get into relationships, and that becomes everything to them. You know, that week-long relationship is going to be forever, you know? And so they start cutting away friends, you know, and their friends are saying, hey, what's wrong with you? You know, let's hang out. No, I can't because... I, I have this beautiful young lady and I have to be with her at all times, at all waking moments. And I have to say I love you 3,000 times before I fa- hang up the phone. You know, it's just things I got to do. And, you know, and, it's, and sometimes it's good, right? Like sometimes you have to have that very specific, this is all that matters, Right? Especially in situations where um, maybe you're taking care of a loved one. You know, they're, they're sick, um, they need help, um, maybe they're on their way to passing away. And so they become everything. And that's really important. And everything does need to be put to the, to the wayside. You have to make those appointments. You have to make sure, you know. And then there's the things that don't matter, right? It's... Um, well, I got to have that relationship because, you know, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm 14 years old. I'm not getting any younger, <laughs> you know. And so it's this whole, this whole thing. And so, so you have things that don't matter, things that do matter. And then when whatever that is passes, now where are you, oh. right? It, it feels like for, for the teenager, it's like, okay, now I have to go back and, and eat crow, right? It's... Okay, guys, it's, you know, that's never going to happen again. I'm never going to put myself in a situation like that until next week, you know. Um, and so, you know, this, I, but when, when you're no longer needed in, say, a medical situation, it's, oh, man, what's, what's next? You know, it's, how do I, how do I move from here? You know, it's, it's hard because you're not, it's, you have to now adjust to a, to a world that is completely different than what you have been for maybe a year, two years, three years. Who knows? You know, however long that time is. And so it's it's hard to return to normal. I, I mean, have you heard that word? You know, in our world, we have all the the COVID stuff, the restrictions, the lockdowns, the things, and and it's how do we go back to the way it was, right? And it's well, you really can't. It's a, it's a new world, right? It's a new thing. But so often, we allow the small things, the, the things that aren't actually important, 
to trap us into a situation where it, it, we shouldn't, right? I, the job really doesn't mean that much, right? And we, we figure out what is important and what is not, right? And those things that are important should not take the attention that we actually give them. And so today we're kind of talking about that. Um, and so it's, uh, we're going to be talking in the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 2 is where we are. And for those of you, I know we had a lot of new people, or uh, people back for the first time. And if you're new, if this is your first time, we actually have a little bag back there for you. Um, so pick one up. It's a little white bag on the wi- welcome table. If you get nothing out of it, there is a Hershey bar in there. <laughs> okay, so at least you get that. Let me rephrase it. There should be a Hershey bar. We do a lot of work with kids and then teens, and so sometimes they pilfer. So if you don't get a Hershey bar, let me know. We'll beat up a teenager together to make us feel better. There's one right here. <laughs> uh, so we'll take him out, and then we'll go get you a Hershey bar. And so, we'll, um, so anyways, but yeah, so that's that's just for you guys out there. Um, but. We've been, we're, we're doing this series that we're calling Outlook, okay? And what we're talking about is, we should be on our fourth week here, but we're actually kind of on our two and a half week. And the reason is because I was sick for two weeks, and um, I had, two weeks ago I had to mash two different sermons together. Well, not two different, they followed each other, but two sermons together. And we went through two weeks real fast, so we're going to do that again. Not two sermons in one week, I'm just going to explain this. So in that first week, we talked about how our relationship with God is two aspects. There's two aspects to it. There's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is um, Mark 12, 29 through 31. Okay, this this is the what our relationship with God is. And in those two things, there's so much. There's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means all of the, you know, your emotions, all your feelings, all that stuff, um, all of your brain, your mind, your, your thoughts, right? Your actions, right? All these things are to what we're supposed to love God with. That's a lot, right? And that includes time. That includes relationships. That, that includes a lot of stuff when we, when we really start analyzing it right but then on the other side you have love your neighbor as yourself and there's a lot to that and we talked about how you can't do one without without the other to really love god you have to love your neighbor to really love your neighbor you have to love god they're inseparable and so if i go about my business right and i say i love god i'm a christian i love god but if i'm you know, flipping off the guy when I'm run, driving down the freeway, right, because he cut me off, or if I throw poop, my dog's poop, into my neighbor's yard, right, am I loving God? No, because I'm not loving people, right? But then if I go around and I, I, I volunteer at the homeless shelter and I, I do all these good deeds, but I don't read God's word, I don't um, worship God. Am I loving God? Because I am loving people, but am I loving God? No, I'm not. I have to do both. And when I don't do one, the other suffers. Now what I mean by that is, when I don't love God, my relationships with people will suffer. Because I'm not actually really loving them. Because we talked about this with the teens, that every time we, we do something for someone, a lot of the time, it comes from a place of our, our own selfishness, right? I, I bring my dogs in because I just don't want to hear my neighbors say, your dogs bark too much. You know, I don't bring them in because I love him. I love me, and so I don't want to deal with him, you know? And so this idea, so when I don't love one, the other suffers, so when I, when I don't love people, my relationship with God will suffer. Because what does God tell me to do? Love people. Hey, this kid's got it. Okay? Because I'm not loving people. I'm already in disobedience. And that disobedience will grow because I'm not doing what God's called me to. So these things are interlinked. Okay? Um, and so 
That was the first week half sermon. Okay, the second half is we should be motivated then in our relationships, right? And we're focusing on the loving people aspect because a lot of times in the church we focus on us and God. And so in this particular series, we're looking at us loving other people. And so this is the outlook, right? We're looking out. Um, And so we need to be motivated um, by something. And we talked about what is the motivating factor behind loving people. And it's God's holiness, a lot of people say, well, it's God's love. We'll get there. But who God is in his holiness is crazy. Okay? The reason why is because we looked at Revelation chapter 1, and when John, when John encounters Jesus in his fullness, what happens? It says in verse 17 of chapter 1, he drops down, he says, I felt like I um, is one, one that is dead. He feels like he died. You know, it's this overwhelming presence of God. And to him, it's just, I felt like I was dead. Because he understood what it meant to be a human in the presence of God. And we see this in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is brought into the throne room of God. And he says, woe is me, I am a person of unclean lips, a part of a people of unclean lips. He realizes who God is and the the chasm between him and God. And so when we start understanding God's holiness, now we understand why we need to love other people. Because think about this. Uh, Everyone in this room and in this world, at one time, at least, some of us are still there, some of us are not, but at one time we were apart from God. Jesus is work on the cross, and the resurrection that proved that the work was true, that brought sinners to God. Okay? That made it possible. Now, every sinner has to accept it, but that covered the the gulf. And we saw this in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 1. Because in each, it was God who fixed so in um, Isaiah, he says, woe is me, I am a person of unclean lips, of a nation of unclean lips. We're sinners, that's all he's saying. And so what does the angel do? He brings a coal from the altar of God, touches it, and says, now you are clean. It's God's redemption work. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus, he fall, John falls down dead, and Jesus touches him and says, I am the first, I am the last, the one who is dead, and now is raised. He goes into, it's the redemption work of God in both cases. So this is a God thing. God is the one who goes and says, I'm going to breach this chasm. I'm going to be the one that goes across here. I'm the one that's going to span it. I'm the one that's going to bring you back to myself. It's not you. It's me. It's God, not me. And so we talked about this. Okay, that's his holiness. There are people in this world that if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're on the side of God. Okay? You've been brought over. What about the people on the other side? What about those people? Yes, it is the, and that's what we're called to, loving people. When we talk about loving people, a lot of times it's we need to find what's wrong and fix it, Right? Well, what we talk about is the world is the Titanic. It has hit the iceberg of sin. What is our job? It's to get people onto the lifeboats of Christ. Not to fix the ship. The ship's going down. And so what am I supposed to do? The gospel is the the thing that every Christian should be sharing. Now, we can do good, because in our day and age, I don't know if you've heard things like this, don't preach at me, you're hypocrites, I've heard it all before, you've heard these types of things. Okay, sometimes we need to earn the right to speak the gospel. So we need to, if we have a, a neighbor whose fence needs mending, maybe, and we can do that, maybe we need to do it. Okay? 
We need to help trim trees. We need whatever we can do. We need to bring over the cookies. We need to make the tea. Whatever we can do, yes, we need to do it, especially with those who are will push back heavily to the presentation of the gospel. But we do need to do those good things, but we can't leave it there. There has to be at some point a presentation of the gospel. There has to be. Now, in our society, we're taught not to do that. We don't talk about certain things. Religion, you know, um, politics, you know, your, your aunt's mole, you know, whatever. There are certain things you're not supposed to talk about. Because you get smacked. Believe me, I know. I had parents that told me not to talk about certain things. And I don't, ha- I don't have a filter sometimes. And so I'll talk about things. You know... I'm, I'm glad that this is still rounded because many smacks on the back of the head should be flat. You know? And so, but this is, so we need to be people that say, you know what? No. The gospel is important because the fence being mended, the trees being trimmed, the tea being brought, those are all good things, but those are all temporary things. The gospel speaks of eternity. And those things might help them now, but they're not going to help them later. And so we need to take seriously loving people with the gospel. And so that was all one week. Okay? Then next week, I was, we met Doug and Kathy at a, um, from the Navajos. We met them at a pastor's thing. And while we were talking, I felt God saying, you need to invite them on the 16th of January to come and speak. Okay, so I'm praying about what we're talking about. And God brings that to my mind. So the next time I see them, it's like a, a couple months later, I asked Doug, hey, are you available on January 16th to come and speak to the church? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, so this is God moving. He wants the church to hear from Doug. And if you were here last week, I felt um, edified. I felt that encouraged, even though he talked about grace, how we really experience God's grace in endurance. And when we're enduring things, where we're facing trials and we're going through those, we can experience God's grace. And, and really, that's what grace does. It helps us do what we cannot do, right? And so he talked about that. So that was our week two. And I felt like, man, that fits right in this because I just told our people last week we need to be motivated by the holiness, holiness of God to go out there and share the gospel, do good things with the gospel in mind. And when you do that, you're going to be faced with things to endure. Trials, tribulations, you're going to face slander and gossip and all these different things. You talk about, I love uh, different games. I'm a baseball player, but a lot of people are um, football people, so uh, football is easier analogy, right? Because we're coming up to the end Super Bowl. I don't even know who's in there this year. Um, but still yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care because it's the 49ers, so. <laughs> hey, Anyways. Yeah, I know. Nobody cares. No. Nobody cares. Did they play the Packers? Yeah, they play the 49ers. Oh, I don't care. Anyways, uh, I know about the Cardinals. Louise is back there. She is very upset with the Cardinals. Um, anyways, so when you're sharing the gospel, when you're getting out there, in the game, if you're playing football, no one is going to be tackling the second string quarterback on the bench, right? Hopefully. Who are they going after? The people on the field, right? So when you get out onto the field to share the gospel, you are now a target. And so you're going to face more endurance. You have things to endure. You're going to face those trials and tribulations. And guess what? That's what we're going to talk about today. So in Revelation chapter 2, we're going to read 1 through 11. And we're focusing on the churches, not in interpreting them for uh, future, revela- uh, future end time stuff, but just what is happening, what is Jesus addressing in each of these churches. And we're going to divide them into three weeks, into three groups. The first two, the th- second three, and then the last, the last two.
Okay, and the reason why we're doing this is because these are connected by things that are going on in each. Right? There's a lot of ways to, to separate these things, but this is what we're going to do this week. All right? I just got to move this out of my way. So Revelation chapter one or chapter two, verse one. Here we go. This is Jesus speaking. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have preserved, persevered, and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. All right, so we have these two churches that are going, and they're in Asia, uh, in Asia Minor. And if I don't have a picture up there, so I'm going to, and I, I don't have a, I love whiteboards, and I don't have that either because they broke it. Um, and so you have to picture this with me, all right? Because if I do it this way, it doesn't make sense. So, you hear? This is Turkey, all right? This is Mediterranean, okay? This is, this is Israel right here, okay? All right, everyone can see that? Okay, good. Just picture it in your mind. All right. So Ephesus is down here. All right. Smyrna is right here. Okay. Got it? All right. Now that we have that perfect um, geography in our mind. Um, so you have these really close two churches. Let's talk about Ephesus first. Ephesus is in this situation where they, Jesus commends them because they're standing against heresy. Side note real fast, heresy is not just any teaching, right? Um, it is false teaching that takes Christian teaching and changes it, all right? So Hindus are not practicing heresy, okay? Because they're not changing Christianity. There's other groups, right? There's Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, there's um, Scientology, Universalism, you know, and it keeps going. In fact, if we were going to talk about heresy for a year of Sundays, we would never get through it. There is so much out there that, and it just keeps happening. I mean, you guys ever hear of this thing called TikTok? Yep. You might have heard about it. This is a place where heresy is actually multiplying like, like cockroaches. Like, you know, I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. And it's an easy way for people to spread heresy. Um, and so, so this church is standing against heresy of these, of these different groups. And Jesus says, good job. This is a good thing to stand against heresy, right? So it's good when a Christian says, that's wrong. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Christianity is. It's good to stand against heresy. But, Jesus says, I have this against you. Okay, let's look at that. It says, verse 4, Yeah, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. This is going back to that holiness thing. The Ephesus church was doing really good. And we have to re realize that this is the same church that 
Paul writes his letter to the Ephesians, and this is the church that has that great passage in chapter 6 about the armor of God. So they're, they're, doing, they're fighting the good fight. But Jesus says, I have this against you. What is that? Your first love. You're not back at your first love. Remember the height you have fallen. Remember your relationship with God. What is that relationship? It's loving God, loving people. Remember that height that you have fallen. Right? You're a sinner saved by grace. You're doing great at staying against heresy, but you've lost your first love. And that word forsaken or abandoned in some translations means you've shoved it aside. You've pushed it away. And you know what? It seems like the Ephesus problem is it's about fighting the heresy. Now, I do this in my own life. I love winning debates. You know, and especially against someone that's really, like, really rude or is it, you know, just mean. I love to shut them down. Like, that feels good to me. And I used to do it all the time. Until one day, God's like, you need to knock that off. Because you're not actually showing me to them. You're not pointing them back to me. You're making yourself feel good. And this is what the Ephesians are doing. They are standing, and they're doing good work. It's not, Jesus is not like, no, you need to stop standing against heresy. Let's just have all the heresy out there we can. You know, because at the end, he says, I hate them too. Right? In verse 9, or verse 6. He says, I also hate this, what they're saying, what they're doing. And we don't know a lot about this group. We do know that they have, they're, they're combining Christianity with Balak worship and with sexual immorality. They're very similar to um, what's going on in Corinth when Paul's writing, where they're, they're saying, okay, we were saved by Jesus. He's taken away all of our sin. That way we can do whatever we want. We can engage in whatever thing we want to do. So we know that much. And so Jesus is saying to, to the church, I don't like it either. I, I hate it. I mean, he uses this very stern word. I hate it. Yet, the church isn't returning to their first love. They've forsaken it. It's about the debate. It's about being right. It's about pushing all this heresy away. They're not loving God. They're not loving people. And so that's a problem. Why? Because that will motivate. If, if we are loving God, loving people, then the debate isn't about winning the debate. It's about showing someone back to Christ. So the words I use, the actions I do, I need to be pointing them back. And so now, when I debate someone, it has nothing to do with the, ba- the debate. In fact, I try to avoid the debate. And I started doing, and this is what I teach in our apologetics class, I teach question-based apologetics. I just ask questions. Because if I start doing what's called a po- polemics, which is where you go after someone, I keep going. I feel like a bulldog. You know, and I just go. And so I have to step back and say, okay. And I just ask questions. And then I point to Christ as we go through it. Because that's me. That's what God's worked in me. I'm not saying that's for everyone. But we have to say, am I debating to debate to win? Or am I debating because I want this person to know Christ? That's a huge difference. And that's what's going on with the Ephesians. They're not. They're debating just to win. So then we have Smyrna, and what's interesting about Smyrna, I heard it one time say that um, there's only one church that Jesus doesn't chastise, Um, and I think that's wrong, I think there's two, and Smyrna's one of them. Um, And so he starts out, you know, he he points to his his own infiniteness, okay, he says, I'm the first and the last, and then he points to the resurrection, the, the cross and the resurrection who died and came to life again. We see this in chapter 1, too. And he says, I know your afflictions. He tells the church, I know what you're going through. 
And then he says that you're poor, right? But you are rich. And I've heard this um, interpreted one of two ways. Uh, the first way is that they're poor in spirit and rich in finances. Um, I don't think that's right. I think it's the opposite, that they're poor in finances and rich in Christ. And the reason why is because he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, right? But you are rich. So he's saying like, this is, but there's richness here. Because we've got to think about what's going on. Who are they debating or who are they dealing with in their church? It's this Jewish community, okay? And the majority of Christians that at the beginning were Jewish who came to Christ, right? So if, in a lot of religions, if you were of that religion and then you exit that religion, what happens? Yeah, you get cut off, right? You get ostracized. So probably what's happening is because we get Gentile persecution later in Smyrna through the history that we know. But this early part is it's probably... Jewish Christians who are being cut off. Now, if you had a, a restaurant or if you had some sort of um, business and you had a certain clientele, and I, I view kind of like this, if we had a business in town that winter visitors that would come down, right, and that owner said, you know what, I don't want you guys here, right? How many of you would go to that place? You probably wouldn't, right? Because you would, wouldn't want to be there. Okay? So if a Christian says, you know what? I follow this guy named Jesus. As a Jewish person, you would say, well, you're, you're blasphemy. Like, that's what they would say. And so would they attend or would they go to their restaurant, to their business? No. So what would happen to their finances? They would dry up. And so they're, they're having this confrontation with the Jewish community, and now they're poor. Because you have to understand, Smyrna is not a poor city. This is a really rich city. I mean, they had, and they were, later on, they're considered one of the great uh, emperor worship cities. And so this place is really important. It's a, a center for commerce. It's a, a hub. And so there's a lot of money flowing in here, yet as they're confronting this Jewish community, they're losing that money. They're becoming poor. So Jesus says, I see it. Don't think I don't see it. You know, we do this to God a lot. God, do you see what's going on here? And he's up there going, what? What's going on? I don't see anything. Does he do that? No, he says, I see it. I know it. Back in Exodus, I've heard the cries of my people. God sees it. He hears it. He knows. He knows what's going on. He's telling Samaria, I know it. And so what does he do next? It's all going to be okay, guys. Don't worry about it. It's all going to pass away. You're going to have great days. It's going to get really rich over there. You're going to have suntans. You're going to, you know, drink margaritas on the beach. I don't know. Does he say stuff like that? No. no. It's going to get worse. He tells Smyrna it's going to get worse. That's what you want to hear, right? When it's a bad day. Man, I just had the worst day in the world. And, you know, there's this person wants this, this person wants this, this person. And then someone comes up to you and says, hey, I need this. Really? Let me smack you in the head. Get away from me. Because I'm sick of dealing with it, right? That's how we are. And here's Smyrna, here's Jesus saying, I see it, but you're going to go through more tribulation. There's going to be more. And we actually know from history that in Smyrna, it gets worse. John has this, um, this underling. Um, it's, you know, he's teaching him. His name is Polycarp. Polycarp eventually becomes the bishop. Basically, he's a pastor to all the churches of Smyrna. You know what happens to him at 80 years old? How many of you guys are 80? You don't have to raise your hand. Um, <laughs> at 80 years old, he's following God. You know what happens to him? The Romans come and get him, take him, kill him. Smyrna eventually sees some of the worst persecution during the time of the Diocletian, Diocletian um, persecution. They just see more and more tribulation. And Jesus is telling them that. Letting them know that that's going to happen. 
So how are the two connected? Well, first they're connected by, at the end, what Jesus says. So verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the churches say to the uh, Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's the uh, Ephesus. To Smyrna, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by, at all by the second death. What is Jesus doing here? He says, He's putting eternal perspective here, right? He says, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's eternal perspective. Okay? And the same with the other one. Won't be hurt at all by the second death. This is eternal perspective. So, if you take both, Ephesus, you need to return to your first love. Still do the, the standing against heresy, but when you do, you'll eat of that tree. Smyrna, you're going to be going through persecution. It's going to get worse. Don't worry. Second death can't touch you. So what is Jesus saying? When you're doing these things, what's your perspective need to, need to be? Eternity. Right? It's Him. That's what your perspective begins. And, and if we look, what's the beginning of each of these? It's a focus not on the circumstance, but on Christ. We talked about this in Revelation 1. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is Christ. He's showing you that he's, he's watching. He's there. And then he says, put your eyes on eternity, on God. And the second one, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life. And then at the end, he says, put your eyes on eternity. You do what I say, second, second death has nothing on you. This is eternity focused. So, what are we supposed to do? Where is our focus supposed to be? When we share the gospel, where is our focus supposed to be? On Christ and Him alone. Not on the circumstances, not on the people that would hurt us. Because when we put our eyes on the uh, people that would hurt us, we become the Ephesians. I want to win because you're a jerk and I want to make sure I'm right. You know, one of the things I just heard on the radio, um, uh, the WHO, the, not the band, the World Health Organization, they just came out and said that in 2021, 45 million um, babies were aborted. Now that, like, I heard that and I'm like, oh, that's a genocide. And at the same time, when, we, uh, when I've engaged with people who are pro-choice, pro-abortion, do I, I want to win? Or do I want to point them to Christ? Because I've, the people I've talked to who hold to unbiblical beliefs, and I, I was once one, um, so I'm not, I'm not attacking here. But when we talk to people with unbiblical beliefs, there is a lot of hurt there. I've talked to people who are poor, um, pro-abortion because th their life is so miserable that they, they feel like it's a justification that to, to save a baby. Okay? That they are so hurt and they, they feel like that's the only way. Or I've talked to people who are homosexual and, you know, in the... There have been times when I was younger when I would just go after them. Like, you're wrong. Because I was, you know, win the debate type thing. And then I started just asking questions and listening. And there's a lot of hurt there. I can't tell you, I have not met um, someone that is engaged in the homosexual lifestyle that was not abused as a child. Sexually. There is so much hurt. Who fixes that? Not, not Jeremiah. I can't fix squat. I am, I'm trying to fix myself over here, right? And I can't do that. It's only God. Thank you, David. It's only Christ. And so, I don't want to be like the Ephesian church. I want to have eternal focus. I want them to know Jesus. So I'm going to point them back to Him. 
Can I win the debate? Yeah, I probably could, but what's that going to do for them? They're not going to want to hear the gospel from someone that just beat them over the head. And so I want to be that person that says, Christ and Him alone is who I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to point people back to Him. And you know what? I think why we have Smyrna come right after, I don't think it's just, you know, some people say, well, this is just a circuit. I don't think that's the reason. I think it's because Ephesus did the tribulation wrong. They fell into the trap of just winning. And so Christ is calling Smyrna, you're going to be having this tribulation come to you. Do it right. Learn from Ephesus. Because they're going to read Ephesus and they're going to read themselves. And then it's, I don't want to be like that. I want internal focus. Because the persecution is coming. And so how am I going to handle it? And so we need to have eternal focus. Because guess what? The rest of the world is in persecution right now. All right? I just also heard um, from the, who was it? I can't remember the group. But they said ISIS is still, you know, they're not as strong as they were, but they're still going. And now they're targeting specifically Christians, especially in Iraq. They've killed 3,000 people in the last year. Okay? That's a 9-11 event. Let's put that into perspective. Like 3,000 people. I mean, and we can start seeing it slowly move into the Western world, right? You have CRT, you have all these different things that are coming in. And there's a movement that eventually will bring persecution here. Are we ready for that? Are we, do we have eternal focus that we can endure the tribulations that God will bring to us. And I'm not talking, you know, you want to go, well, the great tribulation. I'm just talking about the tribulations that are going to come. Are we ready for that? Do we have eternal focus? Because if, if we say, yeah, guess what? Are you sharing the gospel? That's eternal focus. And I love, you know, James gets a bad rap a lot of times. A lot of people don't like to read James. But in the beginning of his writing, James 1, 2, you probably have heard this, James says, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when it, whenever you face trials of, all, of many kinds. I don't like that verse. Because I don't like, I mean, when I go through hard stuff, I am not joyful. Believe me. I am murmuring and muttering the whole time. Why do I got to do this? What's up with this? Why do we have to do this one more time? What is wrong with this? Why is the pastor preaching too long? You know, just stuff like that. <laughs> you know? And you know what? You can tell who's not paying attention, or who's paying attention, just enough to know that the, they're like, yeah, he is. That's why they laughed. <laughs> they're agreeing with it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Either that or they're asleep, so. But you know, it's like, I, I don't consider trials joy, and yet, when I have eternal purpose, it does become joy. I've had situations where I've, I've been talking with someone, sharing the gospel, and I've had someone come over and say, hey, Pastor Jeremiah, and the wall, you could see it, the wall just went up. And I was that close from sharing the gospel. We had just spent an hour talking, and we were, I was just, seriously, just about to ask him, so, do you know Jesus? It took an hour to get to that point. Do you know Jesus? And I was, hi, pastor. And because I'm a pastor now, they, won't, they stopped talking to me. That's why I don't like people saying Pastor Jeremiah or introducing me as pastor. I'm just Jeremiah. Because <laughs> I want to share the gospel. And that title actually stops me in, in certain situations. So when you inter if you ever introduce me, this is Jeremiah. How do you know him? I don't know. He's a bum. <laughs> just showed up. However you want to introduce me, I don't care. Just don't introduce me as pastor. Okay? I know it's a nice title, but that stops the gospel in some, case, some cases. But I can find joy even in that. 
because I don't know. I don't know what that person, what happened to that person. Never talk to them again. But I can still find joy because my job isn't to save them. My job is to plant seeds. And they might meet another Christian and be talking and, and they start going down this path of sharing the gospel. And they, Oh, I was actually talking to a guy one time. And he was asking these questions. And he was p- pointing to Jesus in this. And I didn't even realize he was. Maybe there's something to this. You know, I don't know. But I can still find joy in that. And he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Tribulation builds us in the, in the Lord. That gossip, that, that row box, all that stuff builds us. Why? Because sharing, loving people will build our relationship with God. Just like our relationship with God will build loving people. They're interconnected. And Jesus, if you haven't known this verse, you're going to hear it today. John 16, 33. Write that on your, your walls, you know, wherever you can see it. This is one of the most important passages of Scripture. Jesus just told his disciples about persecution, how they're going through it, and then he says this, I have told you these things so that in, may, in me you may have peace. He tells us all the bad things that are to happen. Why? So we may have peace. So we can remember God's in control. In this situation, that situation doesn't matter. God's in control. And then he says, in this world you will have trouble. You ever get one of those books that says the promises of God? How many of them put John 16, 33? You will have trouble. This is a promise of God. In this world, you will have trouble. But, God, I love that. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus overcame. Every situation, every pitfall, every trap, Jesus has overcome. Eternal perspective. All right? So I got a challenge for you this week, because I always do. Oh, do. I didn't do the last one, huh? Oh, I got the last one. I'm sorry. Because I was going to use it with this, but I'll do it without it. Okay. This is the thing. You might sit there and go, I can't do it. Jesus died. He raised. If you accepted him as your Savior, he indwelled you in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. You have everything you need to share the gospel, to have peace in trial, to have joys in trial, to overcome anything that is placed by this world. Why? Why? Because Jesus died for your sins. He raised to prove it. And for you to have eternal life. And he indwells you with the Holy Spirit. Who's going to do all the work. All you have to do is open your mouth. All you have to do is pick up that rake. All you have to do is say, as, as Isaiah said, send me. And he will. You step out in faith into the work of God, God's going to take you and say, let's do this. It's not you. He's done it all. Not just for salvation, but for your walk with Him and for the people around you that He's going to bring into. That's a great thing. Now can I do the last part? All right. So, at the back, at the door, I don't know if I'm going to have enough now, seriously. Um, when I first got to Quartzsite, I printed this map off the computer, okay? It's not up to date. That was 15 years ago, okay? But I think it's a really good map because it gives you the basics. That's really all you need to know. And I had to learn, you know, I drive teens, so I had to learn it, all right? And I, it's basically, Quartzsite can be um, separated into four quadrants. You have the northwest, the northeast, the southeast, the north, the so- southwest. I almost had it. Um, yeah, four quadrants. Like that. Okay. And I put the colors on them. They're not actually like that. Okay. Um, we're up here. Tyson Vendors are over there. Park's over there. Okay. I want to challenge you. 
And when I when I put these in the quadrants, um, well, I didn't, but you know, um, I consider there's Rainbow Acres over here, a part of this quadrant. Okay, La Paz Valley, even though it's over here, I, I consider it this quadrant, and all the vendors and all the LTV, you know, stuff. I want to challenge you this week to take one of these. And what's really good about this, if you're new to town, <laughs> free map. Okay? But I want to challenge you to take this, choose a quadrant this week, just one. And when you're driving around that area or you're walking around because there's vendors everywhere, pray for the people that you're encountering. Maybe God will bring someone into your life and you, it's share the gospel with this person. You might encounter someone, and as you're talking, you're like, I need to pray for this person. Do you mind if I pray with you? What are they going to say? Get away from me, you weirdo. <laughs> or yes. If they say yes, you get to pray with someone. If they say, get away from me, you weirdo, you're in courtside, that's what we are. We're weird. <laughs> so you match the rest of courtside at that point. <laughs> All right? So, but take the one... And when you're going, pick that quadrant, when you're going through that, pray for people. And if you have the opportunity, share the gospel. If you have the opportunity to help, help someone. But point them to Christ. How easy is that? doesn't cost you a bit. Just some leg work. Or some gas. Well, in this case, you know, that's going to cost you a lot. Alright? But God has called us to eternal purposes. To share the gospel with people. And I, I love, you know why I love Quartzsite? Because it's a place where people come together from all different places in this nation. If the gospel goes out from here, it can impact every state, every country. Well, there's only two of us, right? Um, in this North, this North America. If you're going down to um, Mexico, go there too. The gospel can move out from this town to the ends of the earth. That's why I love quartzite. And so, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are great and you are gracious. By your plan, we get to, we get to come to you through Jesus. You sent Jesus to die for us. Jesus, thank you for doing that for being that willing sacrifice from eternity past that you decided that, yes, that cross was going to be your goal so that you could bring us to yourself. And thank you for the resurrection because the re resurrection proves it. It's that historical event that says the, the payment on the cross is real. And so, Lord, we thank you. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray as they go out that we would be a praying people, that we would be a gospel caring people that if something's going to be spread it will be the gospel and that this week that you would that you would take your people and through this town that prayer would just sweep over that your holy spirit would move so mightily that people would feel it and lord that people would come to know you even if it's that seed planted that you're going to grow into great faith Lord, help us be a part of that planting. And Lord, if you allow us to be one of those harvesters where we could talk with someone and share the gospel and then come to Christ, Lord, whatever you would have us, have us do, let us do. Help us to have that eternal perspective that realizes we have it good. We're going to, on that day when you return, we are in perfect joy and we're going to be there for eternity. But Lord, there are going to be people that are left. There are going to be people who are on their way to destruction. That they're on that way to that lake of fire. So Lord, give us your heart that we would be people that have the gospel in our mouths, eternity on a focus, and you doing the work. Lord, we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Love sent my Savior to die in my stead. Why should He love me so? Me 
Safely to Calvary's cross he was led. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior to Calvary go? Why should he love me so? We're going to take an offering right now. If, I don't know if, are we? Jim's gone. Gary just looked at me like he doesn't know. Ansel doesn't know. Never mind. Um, so there's an offering box in the back. Um, but before, before we, do, we head on out, I want to share something with you, okay? So last week, and if you're new here, we're not asking that you give us money, okay? That's not the reason. We, we have a desire to reach our youth. That is our primary uh, ministry here at our church. Um, and so that if you want to give to that, we more than welcome will do that because we want them to know. You know, them getting up and down over here, don't worry, they're going to get smacked later. But no, we love them. We want them to know. If you come during 9.30, you're going to see these kids and you're going to fall over on these kids because they're there and they're, you know, they're running around. We love these kids. But I want to share with you one thing. So last week we had Doug and Kathy Haskins, missionaries, not missionaries, I'm sorry. I got corrected. They are now church planters with the Alliance. Okay? Um, and they've been doing this for 30 years. And there's a lot of need up in the Navajo Nation. And so uh, we were sitting, me and my wife were sitting down with them, and then we asked them, what are some things that you need that maybe we can, as a church, can help? And so we're talking, we're talking, and my wife just, just out of the blue says, um, maybe we could get Jim to come up there with his tractor and help. Now, one thing you have to understand is up there, they, were, they asked the, the tribe for the best, or they asked the tribe for some land. The tribe gave them the worst land they could, which was a mound of sand. It was a sand dune. And so they had to feather this out and make it so they could put um, buildings on. But during the monsoons, if you've never been here during a monsoon, it's like a really heavy rain. That, um, it's like a, a week's worth of rain in 20 minutes. Okay, just out of the blue will happen. And then, yeah, wind, and we have, um, what are they called, microbursts. Um, they've flipped over like 45-foot trailers, you know, just flipped them over like they were tin cans. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy stuff. Well, up there, it destroys that, all that sand. And so he says, you know what we really need is a tractor. It'd be really nice to have our own tractor because they have to barter for tractors. So they have to do things and, you know, and... And when you fix someone's fence for the, tra the use of the tractor, that fence is fixed. Now, next time you need the tractor, there might not be anything for you to do. That's why you go out at night. I told him, go out at night, kick it over, and now you have something new. Oh, no. no, I didn't say it. No. Um, anyways, so I, you know, things started going off in my head. Tractors, okay, tractors. Who has a tractor that I know? And so my parents actually had a tractor. I don't know anything about tractors, so if you do, it's called an Oliver um, it's a 1955 Oliver. has all, everything original. has some rust damage. Um, so I called them up because they don't use it because it's a manual transmission. My mom doesn't like it. Um, yeah, it's up there. Um, it is, and it's, too, it's not comfortable enough. My dad has a really bad back, so he can't use it. So it's been sitting there, and the hydraulic um, um, thing, lines, um, broke. And so I called them up, and I said, hey, what are you guys doing with your tractor? Would you sell it? And so my parents said, well, we'll call you back. So they called me back and said, why do you need a tractor? <laughs> because I think the reason why they did this is because, you know, in the past, you know, I, I would ask them for things, and it's like, why, wait a second. What are you going to use it for, right? So they, they're always asking me this. I think it's habit. Anyways, so I said, well, we have this, you know, I just shared what I shared with you. It's Navajo Nation. And, and my, my mom says, okay, we'll call you back. And so calls me back and says, your dad decided he'd just give it to him. And, but the hydraulics need to be repaired. 
and we don't have the finances right now because they're, they're finishing their house and then they're moving. So he said, we don't have the finances right now to fix it. Um, I said, let me ask the church. So what I'm presenting to you is if you want to, if you feel like God's leading you into that direction, um, we want to get this fixed and out to them. I don't know how much it's going to cost. The guy that comes to fix it comes out this week. So I would just ask you to pray. Pray the, if this is what you want to do. And then what we're going to do is as soon as it's fixed, I'm going to take my truck up to my parents' house, drop that off, pick up his truck and his trailer with the um, tra tractor, send it to the Navajos, come back. Hopefully do this in like two or three days. Okay, they're up in Northern California. So if you feel like God is leading you, and I want you to pray for it this week. If you feel like God's leading you, um, in that box are like little yellow sheets. All you have to do is tractor or Navajo. And then we're going to get that fixed and get them that tractor. So they told me on the market for that particular one because it's an Oliver or whatever from the 1950s. And, you know, people want those cool old things. It's $4,000 on the open market. And, and so I'm like, oh, my wife says, this is why you're generous because your family's generous. I'm like, that's right. My family's better, yeah. The tractor's in Rio Linda, California. Uh, that's up I-5, you have Sacramento, and then it's, if you know Rush Limbaugh, that's what he's talking about. That's my family, is one of them. Um, he, it's right above, it's about 20 minutes from that. Yeah. So, if you can fix it, I mean, you want to take a trip. Um, but yeah, so, but that's our situation right now. So if you want to get to that, that's, that's you know, we're not asking. I'm, and I'm not trying to, like, grift over here to get my parents' money. Because, yeah, they don't need any money. Um, but this is, this is just, and we showed him this tractor. He said, yeah, that'd be perfect for what we need it for. So, um, yeah, so I just, I said, I'm going to present it. And if God so chooses, then we'll get it up there and we'll get going. All right. So I don't know. But, all right, we're going to sing one more song, and then we're going to go. Sound good? I know it's been a long time. I'm sorry. I always tell people our services are an hour and a half. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to say one thing. Yeah. Did I? Oh, well, I don't know. Is it good? Fifty-some years ago, just everybody will know, fifty-some years ago, I was in a SEAL team in Vietnam. I come under heavy automatic weapons fire. And I didn't know what to do. I thought they could make it out of there or not. And so I tried to get a hold of the Coast Guard cutter. I knew they were there somewhere, but the chances of them being there were almost nil. So I made the phone call, and here it come around the corner, and guess who it was? Jim Nichols. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's not feeling well. Oh, that's well. really cool. That is cool. Whoa, you're here. He did something. I didn't know that until two years ago. I came here, and he was out here greeting people, Don. Yeah. And I met him, and we got to talking, and, and he said, well, I was on that boat that day, right? And I said, you're the only one I can count. I said, the chances, you were miles, supposed to be a Foo Clock Island, miles away, and you were there like that. Yeah. God had to there. Oh, Yeah, because yes. he, wow. he used Jim's propensity to go off on his own to, to bring, it, bring him to you. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have a, a hero. This is God at work. You know, thank you for sharing that. That's really cool. All right, well. Okay, would you stand with us, please, singing, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. Yes, there does. <laughs> I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was a sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. It's a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary. For he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody. And I know it's there to stay. Let's hear you now. In in my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody 
perfect heaven's harmony In my heart there rings a melody There rings a melody of love Hey, 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 okay. Is there a, a melody in your heart that rings? Yeah. Some of you, apparently. <laughs> Is there a melody that rings in your heart that holds heaven's harmony? Yes. All right. Yes. So here's the thing. You know when you're driving down the road and someone has their music really loud and you're like, just please turn off your music? Or at least turn it down. Or at least turn it down? Be that person with the gospel. Be out there with that melody and let it shine. Yes. Okay? God is good. That's a beautiful day out there. Enjoy it because it's the day that God made. God bless you. Have a great week. Oh, and, and Wade's tonight, 6 o'clock. So.